Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Tourism in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1 with Realism Overhaul, where I send my Twitch livestream audience to where they want to go, providing that they pay with the in-stream currency struts, which they earn by watching. We begin with a failed Mars lander still in orbit around Mars. Uh, we reverted that attempt because we didn't want to kill the tourists involved, and we had to remove it from the station that it was docked at to free up space for something else arriving. But now we get to put it to some other use. It's not going to land on Mars as such, but it will land. And to that end, we are bringing it to Phobos. So you can see where it is going. Technically, Phobos, we don't really need a lander. The Kerbals could just hop down and hop back up again, even with the EVA packs nerfed by Realism Overhaul. But I decided to be a little bit more formal about it, just in case it took too long to get back to the station around Phobos, right? Because Phobos orbits are really, really slow. So it's possible that the EVA packs might not give the Kerbals enough food, water, and oxygen for the time it takes, not just to get down to the surface, but also get back up to the station. It's probably doable anyway, but just in case, just to be safe, we decided to bring this over here and dock it up with the Phobos portal and there to pick up George and make one B on their trip down to the surface. Now you have to be careful with Phobos orbits because the SOI of Phobos is very small and a lot of trajectories will end, end up with having you at the surface. Not really crashing because you're not going fast enough for that, but yeah. Gotta be careful that your rendezvous do not intersect the surface. So here we are docking at Phobos portal and it took some doing. For some reason, docking ports were extra finicky around Phobos. There we go. Uh, and when we dock later after the landing, uh, it is finicky again. So I transferred the Kerbals over, but I forget to transfer the food and water over, which was sort of important. And so I had to redock and get the food and water. The pod already had oxygen, thankfully. And so then, then we were able to get ahead, go ahead with the landing. And we aimed for that very obvious crater right there. I mean, everything sort of sloped around Phobos. There's not, nothing that you could call flat per se. So it's all... I mean, actually at the bottom of that crater is pretty darn flat as we'll soon see. But I just land where we can land. It's not going to tip over or anything. The RCS definitely can hold it in any orientation on Phobos. The main issue is we can't really anchor it, so that's inconvenient. It won't reliably stay stuck to the ground if we've still got the thrusters on, but I think it does have a little bit of a bounce there, but more or less we get it settled. Settled enough for George to get out and head to the bottom of the crater where he will plant a flag. George has aspirations for Phobos. Uh, George views himself as the conqueror of Phobos and certainly was the first one to land on it. And you can see the whole crater is sort of like like a Minecraft sort of <laughs> formation or sort of like the Colosseum or some big arena. I mean, it really it actually looks pretty good, to be honest. If you put a base at the bottom of this, it'd be quite magnificent in a way. Anyway, so, so George is very lightly landing here and we'll plant a flag and in honor of his uh, conquest, I guess, we go with Vinny Vidi Vici. At least in this case, our little Caesar here is not killing a lot of Gauls or something. There is no native inhabitant of Phobos. So it is a, it is a mild conquest, if you will. <laughs> Okay, so here we are getting back into the pod, which is interesting. There we go, all right. And then off of Phobos, which can be managed just with the RCS thrusters. In fact, all, all maneuvers around Phobos can be managed just with the RCS thrusters. And so back to the Phobian portal. Nobody so far has been at all interested in Deimos, by the way, just for you to know. 
and here we go with docking but the first attempt at docking did not work even though it looked pretty good right there but yeah we had to back up and try again something about Phobos makes these things really unwilling to connect but ultimately that one did and we are good so next up we have a Venus window and I decided it would be good to test arrow breaking there by sending some probes over and seeing how they arrow capture. This is not landing on the surface though I put a parachute just so that we could see how it does like that but the goal is to pass it through the atmosphere so it arrow captures and so we don't want to go too low and we were going to launch this in the shuttle mark 2 because we also have some Kerbals who want to go to Skylab. So they had the that's the bare minimum sort of level that they can afford. And so we have these viewer tourists, Zeo Zeon, Aprop, and NST, riding in the Shuttle Mark II atop a Vulcan rocket with six boosters. And it turns out that this is not going to be enough to make orbit. Spoilers. So we're actually going to revert this particular launch. But yeah, we dumped the boosters. It's really, really close though. So this is the end of the first stage and you can see the kind of speed it gets us up to. And then it's sort of about centaur management here in that, of course, the centaur stage doesn't have that much thrust weight ratio. We tried to get it more thrust weight ratio by underfueling it. You saw it only had half the fuel, so that that would help and also help the first stage make sure it could get us as fast as possible. But yeah, that is not orbit and we needed the Shuttle Mark II to try and complete orbit. But of course that cuts into its ability to rendezvous with the station. If we had dumped the probes out of the bay, then maybe we could have done it. But with the probes in the bay, we just didn't have enough. And so I switched over to the new blend. The next rocket up, if you will. As far as capabilities. Except, you know, there, there is Falcon Heavy. Actually, Falcon Heavy would be able to carry more to a lower orbit than New Glenn. But Falcon Heavy also has tremendous lag of 27 engines. So <laughs> there is that. That's why you don't see me launch Falcon Heavy too much. Okay, and here's the end of the core stage. Note that I actually depleted the core stage, and that's because I didn't want to fall short again after just falling short with Falcon. Though we did have the fins on for some reason. Okay, so there's the BE3Us. Maybe one day we'll see this stage in real life, who knows. But here we are making orbit with it. And so that's basically that. And it can deorbit itself, it's got a probe core inside of it and RCS. So we do that after the Shell Mark II separates. And so it has deorbited, and we proceed with the Shuttle Mark II heading over to Skylab. This is actually sort of a touchy situation because the Shell Mark II can't easily fit onto Skylab. It has to be rotated in just the right way to be able to approach the one docking port it can dock to right now. And the other docking ports are the CX Aerospace docking ports, not the stockish docking port so it has to be in this orientation so that it's vertical stabilizers its fins in the back can fit in that gap you see so it's really really tight fit the irony here is that even though we docked we still had to eva transfer the kerbals out because there's a pass-through version of the shuttle mark ii and so it doesn't have the normal transfer crew option because it's not uh sort of enclosed IVA, it's this pass-through kind of system. And then we have to find the crew hatch on Raider Nix Skylab, which isn't necessarily obvious. It's there. Uh, if I think Raider Nick was uh, present during the stream, otherwise I probably wouldn't have been able to find it very easily. Okay, after having transferred the three Kerbals into Skylab, we proceed with deploying the probes. And so trying to get a good orientation for that and then separating the probes out one by one and moving the shuttle mark 2 away from them 
Unfortunately, I had neglected to make the tanks pressure feed tanks or service module tanks or high pressure tanks. I forget whether it is the integrated tank type or the old type. But in any case, we don't have pressure feeding. So ultimately, I had to decide to instead dispose of these probes into the atmosphere. So we flip them around and use the RCS to deorbit them. Alas. So that effort was for not... I didn't separate off the capsule portion and use the heat shield and parachute to recover them. That would have taken too much time during the live stream, though in theory we could have recovered that part. Instead, I decided to try and recover the Shell Mark II, though I wasn't really confident that this would work out. I did hand over control to KOS. This is just a normal shuttle uh, re-entry script that the KOS is running on. And that... This is obviously not the space shuttle. <laughs> it is a very different vehicle. And so its characteristics are different. But I wanted to see how it would do. I recently made videos about the Taurus space plane. And you can compare the wing of that to the wing of the Shuttle Mark II and see that the Shuttle Mark II's wing is tiny by comparison. And basically the wing on the Taurus space plane was informed by the fact that the Shuttle Mark II didn't seem to get enough drag coming back from lunar trajectories. It is lighter than the Taurus space plane uh, right now. So it has that benefit and that's helpful if it's going to transfer itself to the moon because it was designed around the ability to hold Hydro Hydrolox tanks in its bay to transfer to the moon. Uh, we dispensed of that with the Taurus space plane. It can't hold its own propellant to transfer to the moon inside of itself. But in exchange, you know, we can use SLS uh, Block 1B or something else to transfer to the moon. And there's a better chance of the Taurus space plane coming back from the moon using its bigger wing. So anyway, the KOS script handed control to me at 15 kilometers, but we are over water. So, and this is not designed to land in water at all. Uh, we get down to about 100 meters per second, close to it. Uh, that's only a little bit faster than the shuttle. If we could extend our wheels and land on a runway, uh, that would probably be okay. The wheels generally can handle that speed. But we were not over a runway. And so this this died. So, yep. That did not deter me, however, from using the Shuttle Mark II again. And this time we are packing with the lunar fuel, you see. Filling its bay with the Hydrolox tanks so that it can transfer itself. Nevertheless, we're launching it on the SLS Block 1B because it's actually pretty darn heavy when it's got all that fuel in the bay. One of the tourists that we recently brought to Skylab decided that he actually wanted to go over to the moon. And so here we are bringing APROP back to the surface so that APROP can launch on that new Shuttle Mark II headed for the moon. And so the deorbit burn in a Gaganyan spacecraft. It's not just APROP that wanted to go to the moon though. We have to pick up somebody from ISS. Otherwise we could have used the Shuttle Mark II to rendezvous with Skylab to pick up a prop instead of bringing the Gaganyan spacecraft back. But since we have to get to ISS, which is in a very different orbit, well, we can't go from Skylab to ISS with the Shell Mark II. And so we're bringing a prop back. So there goes the aero cap at the top and the pod descending to the surface safely, though apparently with asymmetrical parachutes there, the parachutes were supposed to be the same, but the configuration was not symmetrized. So okay, APROP is now launching with the Shell Mark II with all that fuel in the bay, headed for ISS in order to pick up its Nico, who also wanted to go to the moon. And this is just your normal SLS Block 1B here. I didn't want to do anything too fancy. Off go the boosters, so no shuttle mice basically, or special boosters. Between the Shuttle Mark II with all the fuel in its bay and the Venus probes which now have the pressure fed tanks, we've got two of them on the payload adapter there. Uh, this is the maximum capacity for the SLS Block 1B uh, to low Earth orbit. And so, yeah, we have to go with this sort of high flung trajectory in order to have the time. Though, uh, I say that, but we underfueled the 
uh, Block 1B, the EUS stage. So there is that. Yep, we're just about getting to orbit. Well, I wanted to deorbit the Block 1B stage, so I had it hold short of orbit. Ah, I neglected that I used methane and oxygen in the bay for the Shell Mark II in this case. It's denser and that sort of helps with the Delta V, but of course requires a larger launcher. So we were very heavy with the, I think it was 85 tons with the Shell Mark II there. Uh, the hydrogen oxygen mix offers a little bit less Delta V, but it's lighter for the launcher. So that's helpful. You can launch on a smaller launcher. But this time I was packing uh, methane and oxygen with methane and oxygen transfer engines. So we got transfers for the little probes to Venus, but because I wanted the lowest delta V, we have to wait for about two weeks for those. And here the Shell Mark II is rendezvousing with ISS to pick up its NICO. And again, its NICO had to EVA out to the Shell Mark II, and this time we didn't bother docking the Shell Mark II to the ISS, even though it could probably just safer not to. And so there's a nice view of its Nico head over to the Shell Mark II. So again, the size of the bay for the Shell Mark II was built around just enough hydrogen and oxygen for a transfer to the moon. But if you have a denser propellant like methane and oxygen, then you can get more Delta V out of that, but it overburdens the launch vehicle, so you need a larger launch vehicle. All right, so departing ISS, and actually this is the lunar, translunar injection burn. So we're starting out right here. It is a long burn with these engines. But we get done, and APROP and its NICO are on their way to the moon. Meanwhile, it is still the Venus window, and we had a tourist for Venus. One who wanted to just fly by Venus, and that was Envy Silence. I didn't really offer MV Silence particularly good accommodations. Basically, MV Silence would have to deal with just a Mark II lander can and perhaps some extra room once uh, he cleared out all the food, water, and oxygen in the supply areas. We are launching on a standard SLS, but the stages underneath the Mark II lander can are hydrogen tanks fueling a nuclear stage. So it's a nuclear transfer stage and hopefully a nuclear stage that will bring NB Silence back. The issue, of course, is boil-off, which we were hoping that the tanks would control, but yeah, that's, that's a story for another time. Anyway, separating the boosters. Assuming that the boil-off could be limited, then the Delta V would be quite enough to go to Venus, capture around Venus, and return back to Earth and capture around Earth, but yeah, that's an if. So here we are with EUS completing orbit and still with some fuel to help us with the transfer, so we do make use of that. And I decided that this was a nice enough view to uh, drop the UI with. This is the transfer burn to Venus for NV Silence, and then of course we have to decouple the EUS stage. Off it goes and begin with the Timberwind nuclear stage. But it turns out that I had put it on the wrong node there. That happens sometimes. I'm on the wrong node on the inner stage, and so Envy Silence has some work to do. Basically disassembling everything in order. Because we can't disassemble some part in the middle, we have to disassemble the, all the parts leading up to it here. Yeah, see, it won't let us do something that has a child part attached to it. So we go in order. There's the that oxygen tank. There we go. We can't be too far away from things. And then finally, we get the pesky interstage and get MV Silence back into the pod to complete the burn. The burn ultimately does get MV Silence on a trajectory to Venus without any mid course adjustment and it will take about 1700 meters per second to capture around Venus, we find out. So MV Silence is on his way, and we'll find out what happens to him in a later episode. For now, as this transfer completes, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.